Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I had a few words prepared, but I, I knew it would be hard to follow Professor Frederic Genie. I guess I didn't realize it would be that hard. So uh, I'm tempted to say the session is over even before it starts. But I think we should do our best uh, uh, to follow up uh, on uh, Fred Genie. Uh, by having a very interesting and engaging uh, intellectual discussion and nothing better for that than discussing vertical restraints in e-commerce. I know the topic might sound boring, but it's actually, honestly, extremely interesting. And uh, just before um, uh, saying a few general words about e-commerce and about uh, this more general topic of the digital economy, which was, of course, very much mentioned both by Fred Geni and by Antonio Gomes, uh, this uh, these topics have been at the core of the OECD work. Just in the last three years, uh, we had uh, many discussions by the OECD Competition Committee about algorithms and collusion, uh, big data, disruptive innovation, blockchain, uh, you name it. If there is a topic, a competition issue in digital markets going on, most likely the OECD Competition Committee has looked at it. And if not, probably it's looking at it right now. Fred mentioned uh, the decision um, about the AT&T and the Warner, Time Warner merger, and indeed uh, we are looking at the vertical mergers right now in the TMT sector. Uh, last year we had a discussion on, uh, on the implications of e-commerce for competition, and um, this topic of uh, e-commerce is a giant, giant box. If we open it, many things come out of it, abuse of dominance, uh, in, by online platforms, haven't spoken tales, horizontal collusion, and of course, vertical restraints, which to date are the number one area of antitrust that has seen, that has seen the greatest amount of enforcement. And uh, then if we open this uh, still big box of vertical restraints, many things come out. Uh, exclusivity agreements, uh, retail price maintenance, and so on and so on. Now, each of these topics are a Pandora's box on their own. They are extremely complex. They are probably some of the most complex issues that we have worked, vertical strains. And today we are going to try to open two Pandora's box. Uh, the first, selective distribution models, and the second, uh, most favored nation clauses. Now, they are very hard, but we are lucky because we couldn't count with a, a better uh, panel of expert speakers, uh, which I'll now introduce. So, here to my left, first there was a, a small change. We would count initially with the Birgit Kruger from the Bunch Cartel Amps. Uh, due to a last minute change, we were very lucky to, uh, uh, to be able to replace her. So we lost a star, but we won another star. And uh, we have uh, with us uh, Gunnar Kalfas, and he's the head of unit for German and European antitrust law in the general policy division of the German Bunch Cartel Amt, which by the way, uh, is uh, a prestigious competition authority with a lot of enforcement experience in this area. So we are very lucky uh, to have uh, Gunnar with us. Um, and before uh, uh, his current position, he was um, a legal advisor in the department dealing with litigation and uh, legal issues and case officer in the sixth deci decision division, which by the way, is responsible for media and sports. Now, to my right, uh, at my right, uh, we have with us Professor Pina Rackman. Uh, she's Professor of Competition Law and Director of the Center for Business Law and Practice at University of Leeds. Now, I have uh, here just a few information that uh, Pinar was uh, in the last three years uh, um, shortlisted for um, the antitrust uh, winning awards. And there is a prize that she won. That prize is the Leverhulme Prize. I hope I said the name right and sorry to read this, but this recognizes the achievement of outstanding researchers whose work has already attracted international recognition and whose future career is exceptionally promising. So, Pinner, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, finally, uh, we count also with Dr. Paolo Bocirossi, who is the director and founder of LEAR, uh, com uh, specialized economic consultancy in uh, the fields of uh, competition policy and regulation. And apart from the many publications of Paolo, he has been engaged uh, in economic advising and uh, uh, in economic research with many uh, public institutions, the European Commission, the World Bank, uh, several competition authorities and governments. And I believe that to that list we have to add the OECD because I remember reading one of our reports that was written by you. Uh, so it's uh, a big list. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining. Now we 
I, I'm going to structure this discussion as a conversation, which means that now I'll shut up myself and engage in a conversation with all the panel speakers. Um, and so I open now the part on selective distribution models, which are basically vertical agreements through which a supplier um, restricts the number of authorized distributors. I hope I did, uh, I think this definition comes in one of your papers, I hope I did it right. And Paolo, I will start with you. Uh, the main objectives as uh, I get from the uh, selective distribution models are to promote, uh, the, to guarantee the reputation of a brand, uh, to create incentives uh, for, to, for the provision of pre-sales services, to promote investment, etc. But I understand that they pose a major competition concern, uh, the, the reduction of interbrand competition. And in the case of e-commerce markets, what happens many times is that these suppliers uh, basically try to prevent uh, the distributors from selling online, to avoid online competition, which can be very fierce. And so my question for you is, uh, in light of this risk of restricting online competition, are there any efficiency gains that could justify the use of selective distribution models that uh, restrict online competition? Okay, Pedro, thank you very much for your question. Before answering that, let me thank also the OECD and the organizer of this conference for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, here with uh, such, uh, um, such an audience. All right, I your question is very complex. I mean, we have to step back a little bit and to understand what are the efficiency reasons to have uh, a selective distribution system in the first place. And you're right, I mean, uh, the selective distribution framework means that there, are, uh, there is a vertical arrangement and this means that there are at least two markets, a retail market and an upstream market. And selective distribution is a model that is uh, used for differentiated products. So this means that there is price competition and non-price competition. And both forms of competition take place at both levels, at the retail levels and the, the upstream level. Now, the main reason why uh, a selective distribution system can be efficient is that it induces a different balance between uh, price competition and non-price competition at the retail level. And, uh, and, uh, and this can lead to a situation where consumers are better off. Uh, now, the, I believe that, you know, the economic foundation for this efficiency is not really that uh, for some markets, let's say, quality is more important than price. That would be a very dangerous uh, statement. Uh, but it's rather than, you know, the decision to achieve this different balance is taken by a firm that operates at a different level. So there is generally a vertical externality and the vertical externality uh, has the same sign if you go from the retailer to the consumer and if you go upward from the retailer to the upstream producer. And so this means that the interest of the upstream producer is more aligned with uh, the, uh, the consumer interest. But Paolo, if, if I may ask, do you think it could make sense uh, to promote some kind of quality competition at the cost of price competition in this context of vertical restraints? Because I think courts would never accept that, common that uh, justification, for example, in the case of horizontal collusion. Companies cannot say, oh, we are colluding on prices yeah. just to guarantee that we'll provide a service with high quality. Good point. Yes, definitely. If you have that the interest of coordinating on quality or coordinating on price to achieve more quality is just a decision that is made by, you know, the retailers, we should be very suspicious. At the same time, courts do recognize that quality might be more important than price competition, and, uh, and indeed we have uh, several judgments by the European Court of Justice in which this is, uh, this is clearly stated. And it's stated in a way that, you know, uh, it gives a presumption that uh, such an arrangement doesn't conflict with Article 111, which means basically that it doesn't need to be an exception. It's, it's compatible with, uh, with competition. It's a, it's a way to compete. It's, a, it's a, 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 a genuine way to compete. 
Uh, in terms of the quality dimensions that could be appropriate, uh, so I, I did my homework and read a few of your papers, one uh, published in the European Competition Journal and the other in the Journal of Competition Law and Economics, and you discuss there many of the cases that have shaped the, the EU position uh, to, uh, in terms of vertical restraints, and I'm talking about the Metro case, the Pierre Fabre, the Coty case, and uh, Please correct me if I understood, if I misunderstood, but I, I had a feeling that you had critici some criticism with respect to the Pierre Fabre, yeah. uh, because at that point, uh, um, the, basically the Court of Justice said uh, that uh, maintaining a prestigious image is not a legitimate purpose for restricting competition. So do you think, uh, do you believe that maintaining a prestigious image could be, in certain circumstances, a purpose to restrict competition? Uh, I, I do believe that this is a choice that the competition policy, the competition authority are not well equipped to make. I mean, it's much better to uh, have firms making this kind of decision if the brand image is uh, crucial or is important for consumer welfare or for the you know functioning of the market. Uh, that's something that uh, firms do understand, whereas competition authorities lack you know the expertise and the real. Uh, you know, mm, sense of how the market works. Uh, if I may move may now uh, uh, to Pinar to, to ask her a question, because you have a, a lot of uh, experience also in this area, and um, uh, something that uh, through all the, this reading and research that uh, many times is criticized or uh, discussed is the fact that uh, in, the, in the European Union uh, there is some tendency to try to uh, identify which are the circumstances that are per se legal, the ones that are per se illegal. Uh, and we can see that in all these cases and also in the recent uh, inquiry uh, of the e-commerce sector. So, uh, for example, a total ban on uh, uh, the use uh, of the internet is per se illegal. Uh, and the same is true for, um, um, for pr price comparison tools. You cannot ban, the, uh, so suppliers should not ban their use. But on the other hand, uh, it in some occasions it might be okay to restrict the use of uh, a marketplace, for example, uh, if there are concerns of preserving the image. And I'm, of course, talking about the Coty case. So what's your position on that? So what, uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Was that one question? Uh, so basically, do you agree with this uh, per se approach to many vertical restraints? Make a good question short. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you to the OECD Competition Division for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think you put your finger on exactly the hot spot here. What seems to be happening is that at the moment it's not entirely clear what sort of restrictions on sales on the internet will count as hardcore restrictions and what type of restrictions on sales on the internet are not hardcore. Um, and the Coty judgment and the essentially juxtaposing of the Coty judgment with the Pierre Farber judgment still leaves a lot of questions in the air. So I think the court is quite clear in Cotis explaining Pierre Fabre in saying, okay, what we tried to say in that decision was that um, you can restrict competition by adopting a selective distribution model in the first place, because adopting a selective distribution model restricts competition to begin with. You already restricted the sales channels. But once you have restricted competition in that way, you can't further restrict competition by also banning sales online. So that's how the court interprets in Coty its own Pierre Farber judgment. But if you're doing it in another selective distribution system where there isn't an entire sort of total ban on sales online, and you're only doing it essentially to further protect the aura of luxury of your product, and the uh, online sales place is a marketplace which is not particularly luxurious, then essentially the quality enhancement that you're trying to bring with your selective distribution model justifies that ban because if your products are sold on marketplaces which are not as luxurious as your product, according to the court at least, that seems to prevent a problem to the manufacturer in terms of preserving the quality image, which is what justifies the selective distribution in the model, and therefore that sort of restriction is justified in the same way that the court says, okay, the selective distribution model is also justified. That's how I interpret it. But you're right in that it's not entirely clear. So ex ante, we don't know. You know, in the next case that comes before the court, I'm not sure we could tell what will be the <coughs> distinguishing factor. And as Paolo says, I agree that, you know, what is a luxury product and who decides on the 
aura of luxury of a given product. No, I, I would like to come back later to that discussion of luxury and non-luxury products mm -hmm. because I think it's a, a very uh, interesting discussion. But I would also like first uh, uh, to ask you Peter, something uh, more connected with the e-commerce market. So uh, do, you, do you believe that there are uh, stronger or, or weaker presumptions of legality in this context because these questions have typically appeared in the context of e-commerce markets and not other markets. And I think also you have uh, done a point about that, um, uh, Paolo, so if you want later to chip in as well. <laughs> I think I might have, have to give you the economist answer to that question despite being a lawyer and <laughs> said it depends. <laughs> um, I mean, yes and no, because it's... Sorry, that's the lawyer answer. No, that's the economist <laughs> answer. <laughs> that's what the lawyers think the economist <laughs> answer is. Um, I think it depends, and yes and no, because in the statements of the European Commission, for example, they suggest that essentially internet sales should be available to anyone in all means, and restrictions on the internet are just per se restrictions, you know, no matter what. The, some of the statements suggest that. Um, the guidelines do, and you know, before Coty, I think that's how Pierre Faber was interpreted as well. But on the other hand, you know, the Commission guidelines also allow for quality restrictions to be placed on sales on the internet. So, for example, this Commission says that it's okay to exclude an online only retailer from your selective distribution market just because they're online only. And that's seen as, you know, equality again, restraint that the selective distributor or the manufacturer can impose in its selective distribution system. So it's kind of a balance. It's kind of a balance, I think. And also remember in the EU and, you know, um, competition laws modeled on the EU, there's always the possibility of an exception found in Article 1013 in the EU that even if it's hardcore and even if it's a by object restriction, there is always the possibility to justify it. So that finding of an object restriction is never the end of the assessment. Yes, but there is a very hard onus of proof, yeah. of course. It's very mm. much sure. But I mean, let me also say, I mean, in the EU, there is already a distinction between hardcore vertical restraints and those that are not. So it, this isn't specific to online markets. We know from the block exemption regulation, even though the regulation is only about vertical restraints, some vertical restraints are deemed to be hardcore, not because, not when they're online, they're just deemed to be by object restrictions despite being vertical. So the EU approach is not entirely effects-based anyway. In that sense, I don't think that online vertical restraints are treated particularly differently. In a way, I think the courts are trying to apply the traditional rules in just a different setting, which is internet. I see. So uh, now I would... Uh Pedro, can I, can I add you a few thoughts? Chip in, of <laughs> because <course>. Yes, <laughs> you invited me to chip in. And I want to go back also to your first question, because uh, if, if, you know, if the uh, efficiency reason for having selective distribution is to get a different balance between price and non-price competition, and the internet is a very powerful tool for competition, and I just got a publication here that seems very interesting. It's an OECD publication that say quality consideration in digital zero price market. And you know, on I the internet is considered to be a very effective tool to increase price competition. Now, if this is true, the effect of having online sale will be to spur price competition and possibly diminishing non-price competition. So if, you know, rebalancing the two was the efficiency reason in the first place, uh, it is the very efficiency reason to justify a restriction on the use of the internet for, for, for uh, as a, a distribution model, um, channel. So the fact that internet is very, uh, you know, a system that leads to very fierce competition is the reason, is the efficiency reason for restricting it. Might seem strange, but if you think twice, that's, you know, the right answer. A very, very short question. When we promote competition, generally, shouldn't we promote at the same time price competition and non-price dim dimensions, or is indeed a trade-off between the two? Is there a risk that if, tr if we try to focus too much on price competition, we'll forget the quality side, uh, and that uh, will have negative effects for consumers? There is generally a trade-off. So you cannot get always both of them, you know, uh, at the maximum level. 
sometimes you have to sacrifice one of the two to get the other one. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> uh, well, let me then uh, now move to Gruna. Uh, I would like to ask you if you agree the positions made so far, and uh, particularly to ask you about some of the enforcement experience of the Wunschkartel Amt. I mean, we, d we already mentioned uh, uh, the Metro, the Pierre Favre, the Coty case, but uh, the Wunschkartel has also a very interesting case, the ASICS case. So I would like to ask you a little bit about your position regarding what was said so far, and if you could illustrate a little bit as well with uh, the, the experience of the Wunschkartel. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, let me first of all excuse Birgit Kruger, who would uh, have very much liked to come today, but I couldn't do it. Uh, I'm all the more happy to, to uh, be here. Um, I would take up something that uh, Fred Chani said in his speech, and that is the importance of uh, facts and um, also of cases of investigations. I think the, um, the theory of uh, vertical restraints is well understood, and uh, Paolo uh, explained it uh, at the beginning of this panel, but I think it's uh, also important to, to do cases, to, to investigate the markets, to see what are the, uh, the real life situations that we uh, look at. And um, we as Bundeskartellamt, a few years ago, we saw uh, a sort of uh, renaissance or proliferation of selective distribution systems uh, in all sorts of uh, sectors and uh, not limited to, to luxury products or um, technical goods, the, the traditional products you would think of, and that of course makes you suspicious as, as an enforcer. And uh, I mean, that was one of the reasons we, we digged a bit deeper and uh, had the feeling that uh, in some instances, these selective distribution systems and especially uh, online restrictions within um, might be a, a sort of a smoke screen um, to, uh, to have a means uh, to, to follow purely uh, anti-competitive um, um, aims and especially to, to restrict or to lock out um, uh, innovative or price aggressive uh, newcomers. On the other hand, we of course also agree with what um, Paolo said that competition is not only about prices and that um, uh, some problems um, that may arise uh, regarding uh, quality requirements, uh, free riding and so on, might be intensified by, um, by online competition, which is often very price-centered. So that as a general remark, and um, to um, regarding our ASICS case, I, I cannot explain the, um, the case, and a lot of you will, will be familiar with it. Just before we go to yeah. the case, if I may ask to follow up. So I think we all agree that uh, there is some need to balance. I think the big question is how to balance and uh, how to apply competition in this case. And I felt that from this side, you, you th there would be uh, an intention to apply a more effects-based approach. Uh, would you agree with this position or you think it's better to have uh, a more per se approach, at least for certain kinds of restrictions that are just uh, uh, the, the, the stands are too high. I, for example, if we completely restrict online competition, there is just too much of a risk and no uh, assessment of effects is needed. Yeah, I mean, that is a difficult question because, I, I mean, no one would argue with an uh, effects-based approach, which uh, as such is always a good idea. But then on the other hand, uh, everyone wants uh, legal certainty. And, um, I mean, that is a trade-off and uh, we have uh, the... Uh, the legal framework uh, in Europe with the vertical work exemption regulation, which um, is in a way very generous because it exempts um, all selective distribution systems uh, below the market share of 30% and which has only very limited safety valves, I would say, so means to, to do a uh, case-by-case assessment to really um, yeah, have an uh, effects-based approach. You can, uh, theoretically, you can withdraw the benefits of the Brock exemption regulation, but that never happened. And, uh, and it might be the right way forward to, to allow th this instrument to be more feasible in practice. It is not. So the, the other way to, to come to a uh, more 
case-by-case uh, case, uh, study is to look at the hardcore restrictions and then very often you come to this um, uh, yeah, to this feeling that you have a, a per se rather legality or illegality because it's rather black or white mm -hmm. and uh, I think we as enforcer we, we see the difficulty but uh, there's no easy way out if you uh, want uh, on the other hand you want the legal certainty for the undertakings yeah so Okay, so we can agree that, of course, effects-based is always desirable, but in certain circumstances, maybe it's not practical uh, or uh, that will generate too much legal uncertainty, and in some circumstances, the risk uh, is too high that there could make it could make sense to uh, to restrict uh, or to pre to forbid uh, uh, some hardcore restrictions, uh, some hard hardcore vertical restraints. Uh, so maybe we could now get in, in uh, the ASICS case, which we are, of course, very interested. Yeah, just, yeah, just a, a few words on the ASICS case um, to maybe also to distinguish it a bit from, from the Coty case or to explain the uh, German position, which is always seen as very strict when it comes to um, platform bans. First of all, our ASICS case was uh, not directed against uh, selective distribution as such. It um, just dealt with certain contract clauses that, in our view, um, significantly restricted uh, online sales by authorized retailers within the system. Um, to understand the case, I, I would like to highlight uh, three points. First of all, in the German e-commerce market, intermediaries play a, a very important role, more than in, in other member states which is also a result of the e-commerce sector inquiry by the European Commission. Especially marketplaces are of great importance in Germany. It's not, uh, not a surprise that uh, for Amazon and eBay, Germany is the second uh, most important market. So that may distinguish uh, the German market a bit from, from some other markets, even developed markets. Secondly, our proceedings concerned uh, what we called per se prohibitions, meaning that um, in the contract clauses um, of ASICs, um, the use of intermediaries, uh, marketplaces, but also price comparison sites, and the use of the um, ASICs brand name in uh, search advertising, Google search, um, were not related to, to uh, quality requirements. They just uh, stated uh, marketplaces cannot be used irrespective of the quality. And um, yeah, that we found rather difficult. And the uh, third point, uh, when it comes to the reasons why we took up this case, um, one important aspect was that uh, in these markets, uh, similar restrictions were used by all major um, manufacturers. So in the market for running shoes, we have uh, Nike, uh, Nike, Adidas, and Asics with a combined market share about 75%. And they all, in a very similar way, restricted uh, online sales. So there we had a feeling that uh, this might also be um, a danger for uh, interbrand competition. Um, so just to, to clarify one issue, so I have looked uh, recently at the contribution uh, by the Bundeskartelamt for last year uh, round table and uh, they, they also discussed there in detail uh, the ASICS case and they discussed the, there the issues that you're referring to. Uh, they mentioned, if, if just to summarize, the three main issues which are the prohibition of uh, uh, third-party platform sales, the prohibition of the use of price comparison websites, and restrictions on online advertisement. So there are indeed many restrictions. There were many concerns uh, analyzed uh, in this case. But uh, if I understood correctly, now please correct me if this is, uh, this, this is not right, uh, is that uh, in, a la in, a, in a publication by the Bundeskartel about that case, uh, they or, or in a later decision, there, there were two of these issues were fully addressed, fully solved, but the question of uh, whether the prohibition of third-party platform sales was a problem or was not a problem, that was left open. And uh, my question is, was that left open because, the cons be because of the question about uh, was it a luxury product, was it not a luxury product, is the importance of the brand, uh, uh, important is uh, the reputation of the brand important? 
no, the, the discussion around uh, the luxury products and what is meant by luxury products um, is newer. We, we didn't discuss that at, at the time of, of the dis decision. But uh, the background um, to, to our decision to, to leave this question open or not to, yeah, not to do a final statement on the um, legality of marketplace bans is rather to be found in the, um, in the vertical block exemption regulation and the guidelines and the commission, commission's position in the guidelines that um, uh, normally it's not hardcore. So uh, we wanted to leave this to the, to the further development. I see. Uh, so just before m moving to the next part on most favored nations, I would like to tell a very short story uh, and from that uh, just to illustrate uh, some of these concerns that you have been discussing so far and uh, from that story to ask uh, one or two general questions to everybody who wants to chip in. So and uh, this story, believe it or not, was about the time when I uh, bought uh, my piano. This might seem odd but when I was uh, choosing that piano I went to a store uh, and uh, I found uh, the best seller in Paris and I'm serious, he allowed me to try all the pianos, he gave me a lot of information, press sales services, he was extremely nice, this is the number one, the best seller of pianos in Paris, I'm not kidding, and uh, he even allowed me to play in a 100,000 Stainway that was in a reserved room, even though he knew that I was not going to buy that piano. Uh, now, at the end, I told him, look, you provide me such a good service, I'm going to buy this piano from you, but I'm still going to do my homework and check the prices in other places. So my question is, if I found a lower price, this is a true story, if I found a lower price, will it be able to match? And he re replied, I cannot promise you that it will be the lowest price that you'll find. What I can promise is that I will do the best price that I can make. I kept my promise and he kept his and I bought the piano from him at a price that it was not the lowest in the market but it was close enough. Now if I was a savvy consumer I would just have gone somewhere else, uh, I'll just have ordered the piano online and uh, free, I would have free ride uh, on, on all these amazing services that the seller provided me. Um, so f my first general question is in a world where we restrict a lot all these uh, uh, all these vertical restraints to prevent some form of online competition, uh, what will happen to the best seller of pianos in Paris? Uh, and uh, another more complicated question is, in this context, in this very specific context, which is very illustrative, is it relevant whether the piano is or is not a luxury good, or instead of questioning that and discussing if I'm buying or not a luxury good, for me it's not luxury, it's essential, but for other people it might be luxury. Uh, instead of discussing that, should we discuss instead whether there is an actual free riding problem in this specific context and whether that free riding problem could justify some vertical restraints uh, and whether those vertical restraints are the only way to guarantee that, uh, uh, that this Piano, the best piano seller in Paris will not go bankruptcy. So, <laughs> what do we do? Well, the story you just told us is a very illustrative of you know the main reasoning for having reason for having selective distribution, and that gives you know uh, thoughts for behavior economic status. Maybe not uh, not all consumers would behave as you did, <laughs> and uh, I guess that mostly would rationally go there and shop at the lowest price, at the lowest available price. So, and this will definitely give troubles to the best uh, piano seller in Paris. Uh, the, 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 let me go back to you know, main, main statement. My main statement is that the, um, the right balance between price competition and non-price competition is better understood by the piano manufacturer. He knows it knows whether it is good to, uh, to, to push for more price competition or not. And I its interest in pushing for the right balance between the two is aligned with your interest. Now, I don't want to get wrong, I mean, to be misunderstood. I do believe that there are theories of ARM that can be applied to selective distribution models. I'm not saying that they are per se efficient. And going back to your question whether per se rules should be applied, I, first of all, I do not think that in Europe at least there are per se rules. 
there are infringement by object, which means something different. Uh, so the best way to, in my, in my view, is to have you know, a clear set of presumptions and a clear way to rebut those presumptions, which goes also to the issue of having fair procedure that uh, Fred was mentioning during his, uh, his speech. So it's not only a, a, a substantive issue, it's also a procedural issue. I mean, if we have a, r a presumption that uh, uh, online, uh, a ban on online sales is an infringement by object, and basically there is no way to overcome this presumption, then it becomes a per se rule, which is not really in line with uh, our system that should allow companies the possibility to improve the efficiency motives behind that. Uh, that but that then, by the way, this question is for all, of course, uh, we are very interested in, in the different opinions, but if uh, uh, restricting online sales or a complete ban of, you, uh, let's say, we tell, we tell the supplier, you cannot forbid your distributors from selling online, if that's out of the table, what could the suppliers do to, to continue providing such good services through these distributors uh, that wouldn't go against competition rules? What would be the alternative? What are the mechanisms available? Or is the piano seller doomed? Uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, that's up to them. I, I, I don't know the piano market so well <laughs> to answer your <laughs> question. No, but sorry. we can. <laughs> <laughs> Sh shall I? I, mean, I? I think your point is much larger than selective distribution models and luxury products and free riding. I think there's a much bigger issue. I had a similar experience. This was a chest of drawers I wanted to buy <laughs> in Leeds, and I wanted to see it. I specifically wanted to see what I'm going to buy, and we went to a furniture shop, and he almost had nothing at all on display and I said, where's all the furniture? And he took out the catalog and I said, but I wanted to, I came here because I want to see it. He said, I can't actually bring them in because it's too expensive. Everybody just buys them online. I mean, if, and there are now stories, at least in the UK, about you know high streets turning into ghost towns because it's just not, they can't make money. But this isn't just a free riding problem. It's the result of the fact that it's so much cheaper to sell things on the internet. And it's not just about luxury products, it's about I think most things we buy, you know. Fair, fair enough, but let me, may, maybe I can ask this to Gunnar, for example, if I'm a, a supplier in, in uh, Germany, uh, I know I cannot forbid my distributor from selling online, but can I tell him at least, okay, if you want to be my distributor, you have to have a showroom, and you have to have a showroom with certain square meters, and to be open at least these times per week, that's minimum. Will this be okay to kind of go around the problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, you don't have to, to supply pure online players. I mean, that is uh, it's common sense and also in the guidelines. And let me add to that uh, your, your little story or your example is uh, about a very specific product. <laughs> and um, if we look at the majority of consumer goods, the free riding often goes both ways. Because if I buy a washing machine or whatever, I often inform myself online and then for some reason or another, I might want to, to pick it up uh, and, and take it home immediately. And therefore, I go to, to a shop knowing um, which product I want to buy because often the, the service and the stationary uh, e-commerce shops, uh, the stationary shops um, isn't really that good. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's more complex than your, I would say, uh, one-sided uh, free riding example and um, it requires of the undertaking of course to 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 get to a sort of multi-channel uh, strategy and to to combine the benefits of um, offline um, outlets and uh, online sales and I think that that is what happens in the market well I have to agree with you my case was very specific and it was probably one of the few circumstances that happened uh, in my in the three years and how I have li been living in Paris but uh, still my point was uh, to ask if it makes sense to look at the specific case to see if there is actually free riding problem or any efficiency that is very important for uh, the survival of the business model I think we should focus more on the upstream market as well I mean because uh, uh, we are talking about the effects on intra-brand competition but there might be um, 
negative effects on competition upstream. And possibly this is the, I, I would believe, the more credible theory of ARM applicable in a selective distribution. By adopting a selective distribution system, uh, companies can uh, soften competition upstream. And, and, uh, and, and so if a competition authority wants to prove, that's my idea, <laughs> its case, it might look at the possibility that that system would reduce competition mm -hmm. upstream. Because, you know, in that case, it makes sense to have uh, uh, in, uh, a manufacturer decide to have a selective distribution model to restrict competition in its own market. Then it makes sense. Uh, I'll just ask because I feel that at this point uh, uh, I have to move to the next topic, but are there any final remarks that uh, anyone wants to make about uh, this selective distribution apart from... Okay, so... No, you, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I mean, just to say, because you asked questions about, you know, can I set rules about times of opening and so on. I mean, if you look at the case law in the EU, if they're qualitative criteria and they're objectively applied to everyone, then you can. And I think the real developments we'll see will come in the really in the area between Pierre, Farber and Coty in terms of figuring out what counts as a restriction closer to an outright ban and what counts as a restriction that's closer to a ban that could be justified in some ways and presumably there will be more case law there which will clarify, mm -hmm. which will clarify what part of restriction falls on which side of that essentially balancing. So that's also a lawyer answer, using a principle of proportionality. <laughs> but that's literally what the court yeah. says, it has to be proportioned and justified. So. Of course. Uh, so, entering now in the second very interesting topic, let's leave aside now the selective distribution models and uh, talk about something that is even harder than this. Uh, and I'm talking about most favored clauses. Now, these most favored clauses are basically a promise by a seller to treat a buyer as favorably as its best buyer. So this means uh, the, the, the seller cannot uh, uh, set uh, uh, worse conditions than it set somewhere else. Now, uh, in the context uh, of e-commerce, um, mo uh, most favored nation clauses have been used uh, uh, in many instances by online platforms and uh, this discussion has a came up over and over again regarding uh, uh, online uh, travel agencies. So uh, in several circumstances you have companies like uh, Booking.com, Expedia, uh, basically saying, that, uh, saying, saying to their sellers, to the hotel chains who put the prices in their platforms, you cannot put worse prices or, or higher prices in our platforms as compared to the, pr to the price that you set uh, uh, in your own website or in other platforms depending on whether these clauses are wide or narrow. And uh, the main objective here is again to, pre to prevent the problem of free riding. So uh, all the discussion just had uh, about the piano store, it also happens in the online world. Uh, so th there is a concern by these platforms that uh, Sav uh, savage consumers just go online, use uh, Booking.com or Expedia to check the different alternatives, and then after having a good service full of pictures and conditions and comparisons, they just go somewhere else uh, um, to book the hotel. Now, this time I'd like to start with Pinar because um, Pinar has uh, published a lot specifically on this topic, and uh, wh when uh, you came here one year ago, uh, we already discussed back then a uh, paper of yours, I believe that was uh, on the Journal of Competition Law and Economics, and now we have a new one, a fresh one that was just published in the end of last year uh, in the Review of Indo Industrial Organization with Daniel Sokol. Uh, and so, uh, what I would start uh, by asking you is, uh, first, what's your view about uh, these most favored nation clauses? Do they pose concerns that, uh, do they pose seri serious concerns? How to balance their efficiency gains, uh, against their theories of harm? Again, it will be <laughs> yes and no answer, I'm afraid. I mean, just maybe to clarify for the sake of, um, I suppose, make, making sure we know absolutely what type of <laughs> clauses we're talking about. So as you described, with a normal MFN clause, you have a particular seller who is supplying the same product to different customers, and the customers that come after the first customer want some reassurance that they're going to get as well, as good a price as the first customer and so on. So that sort of MFN, which is what we saw commonly before these platform of MFNs became an issue, links prices of the same seller for different customers. 
Whereas with the platform MFNs, it's a lot more complicated or complex where the platform MFN links prices for the same customer who would be potentially buying from competing outlets essentially. So in some ways, the platform MFN actually fixes prices between, fixes prices found at different competitors for the same customer. So basically, what and you're saying is that in this context of, uh, online, uh, of online platforms, the mm -hmm. MFNs result uh, in uh, price parity agreements, in, the the in the mm -hmm. equal price. Yeah. They're a lot closer Sorry to price. Sorry if I step in, but uh, uh, you know, that's one of the biggest failure I, I, I had, one of the many, but had <laughs> uh, we advocated as Lair, we, we did a study for the FT, and we advocated for using a different name, which call it, we called them APA a cross-platform parity agreement, and the main reason was that we wanted to avoid any confusion with MFN, which, are, which is a diff totally different uh, um, uh, arrangement, completely different. And there is no real connection between the two. I so have the, the feeling that I would have problems <laughs> for using this term with both you and Finner, because <laughs> you usually use the term price and, parity and, agreement. And we failed. I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we keep calling them and MFN. You, but the contracts call them most favored. Well, they don't call them most favored nation clause, but the contracts of the platform speak of being treated as favorably, essentially having as good prices. So, in a way, so you usually use the term most favored customer clauses to try to. They, but they don't specifically use that. But the way they explain it in their contracts is very similar to how an MFN would work. It's just the complication here is the platform is an intermediary, and the benefit of the clause is received by a third party, not the party to whom the promise is given, which is the platform. It's the consumer that receives the ben benefit rather than the contracting party who receives contractually the benefit of the promise. So, I mean... So, no, I, I, right. I, I must apologize so for uh, using so this <laughs> term. <laughs> I, I knew I would get You're myself right. in trouble, but uh, to be fair, everybody knows these clauses by this term. Yeah. And uh, in, the, yeah, in yeah, fact, absolutely. this distinction is a distinction that is very important to understand when you're talking about something that is probably unproblematic on and when we're talking about something that could raise competition concerns. But even normal MFNs can raise, comp can raise competition problems anyway, because Just they also ones. lead to essentially diminishing the in incentive to reduce price. Because once you have promised to someone, every other is seller is going to also get the same price. You have obviously a lower incentive to reduce price to anyone because you'll have to reduce the price to everyone else who comes next as well. So normal MFNs can also have mm -hmm. very similar effects. It's just with platform MFNs, I think the effects are closer to what economists have been studying as price matching guarantees rather than normal MFNs. And the literature on price matching guarantees in economics is a lot more developed and suggests that actually these are more likely to be anti-competitive than MFNs. Yeah, I mean, so they, they are not necessarily the same, but many of the theories of harm uh, are uh, pretty much similar or even the same. Uh, so to be clear, we're talking about MFNs that result in price parity uh, in the context of online platforms and the usual theories of harm about uh, this. Uh, I mean, now I'm afraid of using the term MFN, but the usual theory of harm associated with these clauses uh, can be uh, that they could facilitate tacit coordination, they could reduce interbrand competition, they could result uh, in the, the exclusion of potential entrants. For example, if a new platform wants uh, to provide services to hotels at a better price, it, uh, it will not be able to gain market share because the hotels still have to set the same prices as they do everywhere else. So there are all these theories of harm. Now, I know I did you a very general question just to warm up. I will do now a very specific one <laughs> instead. So. Uh, now, in, w in your last paper, uh, you, you said that enforcement across jurisdictions has been based on economic theories that not always match up with legal doctrine. So I just have uh, summarized a little bit the economic theories. Could you explain us why they are not matching up with this legal doctrine? Very brief briefly. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be very difficult to explain <laughs> briefly. Um, I think what we, is this the paper with Danny Sokol? Yes. Okay, let me blame him. <laughs> I think what we probably were re referring to was essentially um, the outcome or our conclusion in that paper was looking at all these investigations into platform MFNs and also um, online resale price maintenance. Um, so we did both in that paper. We see that actually in some of these instances, particularly for some of the online RPM cases, there's nothing new here. It's just resale price maintenance applied in an online context. There's nothing specific about these 
that would necessarily require different treatment. Whereas with some others, like platform MFNs, the fact that this is a two-sided market, it's online, there's certain price transparency and so on, might actually require perhaps a different assessment. But what our conclusion was that this lack of clarity when we look at the decisions sort of across the range of decisions from many different jurisdictions, there's a lack of clarity in terms of whether these cases concern A, a vertical restraint, B, a horizontal restraint, mm -hmm. C, is it a restriction of intra-brand competition, or D, is it a restriction of inter-brand competition? Mm -hmm. And when we answer any of these, about which market are we talking? So w on which market, competition between whom, do these clauses restrain? And we saw that there's some sort of really, it's not necessarily a confusion, but a mixing up of theories of collusion with foreclosure. Um, some cases which you would think should have been pursued as hub and spoke cases that were actually pursued as just vertical restraint cases with a horizontal theory of harm. So that was really what we were referring to in saying, okay, in economics, you would be looking at the effects and you would saying, okay, this looks like collusion, this looks like foreclosure, or it might be both. But in the legal cases, it seems like some of this has been mixed. So it might be a foreclosure case, but the legal tool used would have been a rule against anti-competitive agreements and so on. So, so then we a apply the 101, for example, yeah. even though uh, the theory of harm is uh, matches more a foreclosure, abuse of dominance case, for instance. Or you apply 101 in a vertical restraint context, and obviously that indeed that opens up the possibility of applying the vertical block exemption regulation. But really, when you dig deeper into the decisions, the main concern appears to be actually collusion between platforms. But none of the decisions have ever actually alleged any collusion between platforms. Mm -hmm. so just a, a very short follow-up question before, because I, I now would like to move to Guna. So, so I'll just like to, to ask you, in light of this mismatch, uh, do you think there is a lot of divergence in the application of competition law uh, to uh, these uh, MFN cases? I, I think there has been a lot of divergence in that one company in particular is now subject to at least two different rules, maybe more because there's been legislation as well, Booking.com, um, in its contracts is now subject to per se ban of all of its MFN clauses in some jurisdictions um, or a partial ban of its wide MFN, so MFNs that um, reach for parity across all platforms and all sales channels, but it can still apply its sort of so-called narrow MFNs and, I mean, for legal certainty and business certainty, obviously this can't be really... Well, I would like, I would like to, to go later now back again to the narrow and wide clauses because I also think that this distinction is very important and relevant. But first, uh, I would like to ask Una, do you agree that there is uh, a divergence of approaches uh, across uh, authorities? Is that important or I it is not? Uh, and if there is, does the Bunch Catalan has a consi consistent approach and what, uh, so what's our views on yeah, that? last question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we have a consistent approach <laughs> as Bundes Kartellamt. No, but I also think that the, uh, this discussion about the uh, convergence within the ECN or within Europe uh, seems a bit uh, excessive to me because we have an, a broad consensus that, um, uh, that white MFNs, uh, I would call them like this <laughs> because everybody does, that they are um, problematic from a um, competition point of view, which might even justify thinking about um, making them a, a hardcore restriction in the view of, of some. And I think that is an issue that will be discussed in the, uh, in the ongoing discussion on the vertical block exemption regulation. And um, that narrow MFNs, I mean MFNs that relate only to the um, to the own website of the hotel, if you look at uh, hotel booking platforms, that they have to be analyzed more on a case specific um, basis. And um, I think the divergence in these cases was to a large extent um, due to priority setting by the authorities, meaning uh, are we willing to, to invest more um, into these cases and to, uh, yeah, further investigate the effects of these narrow MFNs and go to court with this, or are we happy with a with a quick solution? And I mean, um, 
some decided for the quick solution and then later the national legislator um, said we are not happy with that and we we will now ban all MFNs yeah which was the case in, in I think in Italy and in France and um, Others like us, we, we followed on and uh, did the case also regarding narrow MFNs and um, our case is, is still pending in court. So we, <laughs> we still have trouble with this case. And I think this was the, the basic differences, uh, difference. And then you also have to see that um, market circumstances or market conditions were also uh, different in, in different member states depending on um, if you have rather a landscape with small um, hotels or big chains uh, because that might have a huge influence on the possible free riding issue. So uh, actually th this um, allows me to ask the question back because both from uh, Pinar and Paolo, I, uh, actually and from you as well, I th uh, this was uh, one of the points that's uh, why it's qu quite consensual and effects-based approach uh, is usually a good approach uh, generally. Uh, but if we implement, for example, systematically an effects-based approach to these MFNs, shouldn't we expect uh, some divergence uh, in the decisions because the circumstances in countries would be different and the hotels, uh, the hotel market will also be different in different uh, geographical markets? Uh, this is a general question. Uh, I don't think this explains the divergence in outcomes that we, we saw in the Booking.com case. Uh, I do not read in the decision a uh, you know, very detailed description of the market that could justify a different conclusion. So it was a different reading of the extent of the prohibition, probably. Oh, well, since you are on Paolo, I have a, qu a very specific question for you as well. <laughs> okay. uh, because uh, I, I have found a symposium that you have th done on competition and law and policy debate, I believe, in Belgrade. And uh, back then, you discussed a little bit the importance of building the theory of harm based on the factual assertions and logical propositions. Uh, this is from you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just to make sure. <laughs> uh, I so, um, uh, I will. Uh, in light of this uh, diversion that you just discussed uh, and uh, all these uh, rising difficulties, uh, again briefly, uh, how would you advise as an economic advisor uh, in uh, what, what do you believe are the most important factors when building a theory of harm in these cases? How, f how should the, the thoughts and the uh -huh. be organized and structured? And well, the first thing is to understand the, 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 the strategic effect of uh, this kind of uh, uh, close and and the main effect uh, and to recognize that the main effect takes place in the platform market uh, if you have a parity close if platform a has a parity close what I call a parity close uh, this means that uh, sellers that uh, uh, operate on that platform and on a competing platform cannot charge to the end buyers a lower price on other platforms that uh, charge to the seller lower platform commission, for instance. And, and, the, and the effect of this is to r reduce the demand elasticity of the platform. So basically it means that a platform that lowers its own prouse, price has a smaller reward, okay? So there is less reason for being aggressive on the platform market, charging uh, lower prices. Uh, and and this, is, this is the main ingredient. I mean, that this is a fact. So we don't, we, I don't think that there is anyone that would question this, this fact. Uh, but this is the ingredient that can be used to build a theory of arm or even an economic justification, efficiency justification. And the theory of R can be that uh, either that the, up the upstream market, the platform market, I wouldn't say the upstream market, the platform market is less competitive, so it's a soft in competition theory of R, or that uh, a dominant platform could prevent a new platform to su successfully entering the market with a business model in which it charges a low 
uh, commission to sellers. And, and basically, the, the, the same fact can also be used to, uh, to build an efficiency uh, story. And the story here might be that uh, a new platform want to use the party clause in order to avoid that the incumbent use prices to uh, push the new entrant out of the market. Um, and so that's the fact we have to recognize and then see which theory of R or which uh, efficiency justification is more likely to be um, uh, coherent, consistent with the characteristics of the market. So if there is a dominant company, dominant platform, probably the foreclosure theory of R is the most plausible. If there are several platforms with equal market share, for instance, then the softening combination theory of R is more likely. And if the parity clause has been adopted by a new entrant, then the uh, efficiency justification seems so uh, uh, I've, uh, as uh, we are getting short on time, I'll just now ask a, a question to Gunnar. To I'd like to ask if uh, this approach uh, has been used, or if is the has a or if the Bundesliga Catalan has a very uh, different approach, and in particular, uh, uh, in the con for example, in the context of the case uh, HRS. So there are a lot of cases about uh, Booking.com and uh, Expedia, but this is a case uh, that uh, actually the Bundesliga Catalan has uh, enforced. So could you tell us about a little bit how you built, uh, how the Bunch Cartan built the theory of harm in, in, in this case and uh, if it uh, diverges a lot from, for example, what Paolo said? No, I, I totally agree w um, with what uh, Paolo said about the uh, theory of harm. And um, in the market in, in Germany, we had um, three main players at the time, which were HRS, a, a German player, um, Booking.com and Expedia. And um, all three of them used um, this sort of um, MFN clauses. So our story was a, a story of a softening of, of competition. And um, at that time, HRS was the most important player. So we started with, uh, with HRS. Uh, nowadays, it's of course, Booking is, uh, overtook them and are by, by far the, the most important. And I think um, there's not much discussion about the um, theory of harm. There has been more discussion when it comes to efficiencies and to the problem of free riding. Um, and I think that really is an interesting um, topic because uh, from a theoretical point of view, there might be free riding, um, as has already been des described uh, on this panel, but um, if you look at it, uh, on, on look at the facts of the case, there's actually very little free riding, even surprisingly little free riding. Um, as I mentioned, our booking case is, is pending before court, and um, the court gave us uh, some uh, homework to do, and uh, so we had to, to investigate, and we uh, made a consumer survey, and we asked the hotels and the platforms and everyone, and the results are rather striking because um, I, I don't know the, the actual numbers, but nearly everyone who finds a hotel on a booking platform um, books, uh, does the booking on the platform too. And um, of course, the, the larger hotels and hotel chains, they have their all own real-time booking um, possibilities, but uh, they are mainly or only used by regular guests. Um, that already know which hotel they want to go to. So there's a, there's a clear cut distinction be between these two customer groups. And um, I mean, it's, it's even more shocking <laughs> because consumers are much more lazy than you would think. They do not, do not even modify the, the ranking on the first page of, um, of uh, yeah, booking or whoever, but most of them even book one of the first four or five hotels that they see. So, I mean, with such customers, obviously the free riding issue is not that important. So, just to be clear, the Bunch Cartel Amt actually looked at the evidence of free riding in this specific case, and which appears to be much smaller, the level of free riding, than as compared to other markets, for example, the peanut market, where the free riding might pose a bigger problem. Uh, just a very small s uh, follow up question. How, uh, this assessment uh, of, uh, of the evidence of free riding was, of course, uh, made in a context where 
these most favored nation clauses exist. So is there a risk that if they are lift free riding could the... No, I, for the moment, uh, booking is not allowed to apply the MFN clauses. So we have a, a, a sort of real life experiment at the moment okay. and uh, booking got stronger and stronger in the last two years. So I think... Um, these clauses might not be that important. Um, can, I, <laughs> can, I, can I ask you if you checked whether the hotel uh, do charge lower price on their own platform? Yes, some of them do. And um, I mean, that has also been assessed by the, uh, the European authorities um, in, in an ECN working group very near to the decisions. And there we saw not so huge differences between the member states um, which accepted the commitments and um, in Germany. And um, today we see that there is a bit more of price uh, differentiation, um, but um, yeah, I would say not to a large extent. Can I just throw a spanner in the works before we break for um, coffee maybe? Um, I mean, I don't know if Booking.com still does it in Germany. I suppose they might. But one thing we haven't mentioned is that they don't just have MFNs with hotels. They also have a best price guarantee on their website to consumers. It says on Booking.com, we will not be beaten on price. Find it anywhere else cheaper and we refund you. So if the consumers have seen that, they are sort of resting assured that the price they find is cheaper um, and the interesting thing is all of them, all of the platforms have the same clause, HRS, Expedia, Booking.com and even more interestingly this clause hasn't been subject of any of the enforcement decisions and actually Booking.com put it in its commitments uh, with the Swedish, French and um, uh, Italian authorities in which it legalized the clause by saying uh, we will continue to apply our best price guarantee to our consumers. So you were talking about the effects-based approach. I mean, if you don't adopt an effects-based approach, there's a possibility that you will overlook those other things which might actually have the same effect as the clause one is investigating. So what you're saying is that this MFN clause, in the context of this MFN clause, it's very important to see if any other uh, auxiliary practice are occurring if, uh, apart from the MFN clauses, they are doing something else that might reinforce the anti-competitive effect of the M MFN clauses. Indeed. I mean, if they're anti-competitive, they'll be made more anti-competitive by the best price guarantee. And if they're mm -hmm. not anti-competitive, I guess it's a good price, you know, guarantee to consumers. <laughs> uh, so, as this session starts a little bit later, we still have a couple of times just to see if the audience has any questions. I'm afraid to say that uh, we'll only be able to, to take a uh, few questions. And just as uh, back in college, I'll give the advantage of the f at the front rows to promote people sitting in the front rows instead of the back in the room. Uh, so, are there any questions to the expert speakers? Please, not to me. <laughs> Okay, the last rows there can also there ask is, questions. There is one. Only a few questions. Uh, the, the, the question of luxury. Because it's one of the most difficult issues <laughs> to define what luxury means. Um, in, uh, in antitrust perspective, it could make sense to exchange the, the concept of luxury in order to justify a selective distribution in terms of, of uh, uh, service that require post services uh, or other services that justify a restriction on, on price competition. So not to use this uh, concept that is so uh, uh, difficult to define, but uh, something that is linked uh, with the real service needed that could be destroyed with a pure uh, price competition. Thank you. Well, I, I never use the word luxury or, or reputation, whatever. I just refer to price and non-price competition. Then I would leave to the, to the, to the firms to decide what non-price competition dimensions are important to them and to consumers. So that's the simplest way to handle this, your question. Well, any further questions from the floor? So, following up on uh, the same questions of luxury, what about Veblen concept of goods? No competition, 
can have anomalies. This is what economists call Veblen. So <coughs> a situation where the law of demand and offer, it's not following the path. So what about this and is it this a sign that perhaps we are in a straight jacket because we want to simplify things and give certainty to the companies, but things are much more uh, varied in practice? Thank you. For me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I doubt that Web and product, product will, be, will ever be sold through a selective distribution system, if I understand correctly your, your question. Uh, and the risks. Yeah. Yes. So, those cases, we probably do not have reason to be concerned in the first place because there is not a selective distribution arrangement. Uh, and if you want to intervene, of course, uh, we feel free. And uh, I think we have at least time for an, uh, another question, maybe not related to luxury. Uh, or yes, I, I made myself many questions about the luxury. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Sophia? Uh, in the center. Okay, so we have more of these two questions, one from the center and one from the side. Hello, uh, Suzanne Jude from Cologne International. Uh, I was wondering whether we had any news on the working group uh, formed after the Booking.com case with the tenant CAs uh, were supposed to look at the evolution of the market. There was a first intermediary report in France that was a bit disappointing that suggested that, well, say for Booking.com's competitors, everyone was pretty happy with MFN's uh, uh, hotels and consumer included. So will we have a final report at some point? Uh, as for the moment, there are no plans uh, to, to make another report in the uh, coming months or <laughs> so. Uh, but we have uh, still our, our case before court. And um, as I mentioned, we have some, uh, yeah, some new interesting insights and in how the, the markets um, developed. And I think when we are through with uh, this uh, court case, we will, of course, publish a bit uh, of this. Thank you. And uh, uh, last question from there, from the side. Uh, Paulo Casagrande from Brazil. Uh, Gunnar mentioned that an important issue in having a more strict stance for in, in the evaluation of vertical restrictions uh, in the online sector was that uh, in Germany, marketplaces were very relevant for overall commerce. Uh, would this kind of specificity in this or that country be uh, important in the evaluation of vertical restraints in the online sector uh, for other countries? I mean, do you see this as being an important ingredient in evaluating vertical restraints in, in, in other jurisdictions, uh, or the, the relevance of e-commerce or marketplaces specifically uh, uh, in the overall uh, uh, segment of, of, of commercialization of goods? Thank you. I mean, I think that it's important to, to have the um, possibility to take account of the um, circumstances in your uh, country, in your national markets. Um, what's a bit uh, under discussion is um, what does it mean if you apply the European legal framework, especially the block exemption regulation, can it be that uh, a certain practice is a, a hardcore restriction in one member state and uh, not a hardcore restriction in another member state, which uh, is, of course, a bit uh, difficult um, under this framework. Um, so that's why I said if there are other ways to, to take into account the, the circumstances uh, in, in your country, for example, by withdrawing the benefits if you see that um, competition does not work properly in, in your markets, that would be, in my point, from my point of view, would be a better way. But if we do not have this, I mean, it, uh, there must be an, a possibility to, to take uh, these specific circumstances into account. And um, I mean, it cannot be that uh, you just look from a European perspective and say, okay, if there are a lot of member states where um, platform bans are no problem because we have no platforms. Um, that doesn't help us a lot in Germany, <laughs> I'd say. Well, 
I feel this has been a very interesting discussion, but now that, uh, unfortunately, I'll have closed it because, uh, as I have seen, uh, not only the speakers are fully engaged, but also the audience fully engaged. And uh, at the beginning, I started by saying that I was going to open two Pandora's boxes, and uh, I think I did. <laughs> now, when uh, Pandora opened uh, her original box, which was not a box, it was a jar, by the way, and uh, unleashed uh, all uh, the evil in the world, she tried as much as she could to close uh, the jar. And uh, the only thing that was left was hope. And uh, I think that from this discussion we see that there is actually some hope of finding some agreement in the legal treatment of uh, vertical restraints within uh, e-commerce markets. Those. So thank you so much, first of all, to all the expert speakers for engaging in this very interesting discussion. And uh, uh, in the next session we'll continue uh, a discussion of a very important topic that was mentioned here in a few cases, so the importance of non-price competition. And so we'll, make, uh, we'll have to make a shorter break of only 15 minutes uh, to keep back on track. So if you could be back in the room by 5 to midday, uh, so that we can start sharp at least at midday, but so try to do it at 5 to midday. And again, thank you all very much. <laughs>